Welcome to the Clear the Shelf podcast with Chris and Chris, the show that meets at the intersection of education and entertainment to discuss online arbitrage, retail arbitrage, wholesale, and all facets of selling on Amazon. We'll bring you news, tactics, strategies, insights, stories, and interviews to help you grow your Amazon business. And now, here are your hosts, Chris Grant and Chris Rasick. What's going on, Amazon sellers, and welcome back to the Clear the Shelf podcast with myself and my ultra crepidarian co-host, Chris Rasick. Uh, and just so you guys know, I am, I am digging really, really deep for some of these, uh, these adjectives. Uh, this week was actually the first week uh, that I had to Google, can I use a noun as an adjective? Uh, and I see Chris is, is Googling this now. Please don't do that because it's not the most positive adjective uh, that you can use for somebody. It's, I think it's someone who cries a lot or something uh, like that. Nice. Which I would not. I would not say that to you. Uh, <laughs> but the well is running dry. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll find some more positive ones. Uh, you know, this is this is about the time of year that uh, Chris and I would would usually host our Festivus episode. And uh, we're running short on aluminum poles, but but in the vein of Festivus, we will be airing some grievances today uh, on our behalf and on, on seller's behalf worldwide. Uh, but there's not going to be any feats of strength unless you consider holding back some of what our opinions may be about Amazon, a feat of strength, which uh, which it may be. Uh, today, we're going to be diving into the Amazon fee changes that Amazon has announced for 2024. Um, it's a spider web of, of changes. It's, uh, a lot of it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, and we're going to try to untangle that web if we can, at least a little bit. Now, we're all familiar with fees increasing. Uh, but as I read through these... I just kind of became more and more confused. And uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll do what we can today. Now, before we dive in, uh, you know the drill. This show isn't free. And while it may not cost you anything, uh, you can pay us back if you get something out of this episode by giving us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast player or smashing that thumbs up on YouTube. It helps us a ton uh, and it gets us back behind the mic to, to create more shows like this for you people. So let's go ahead and uh, and let's dive in. And Chris, before we dive in, I think the first thing I want to do is I, I just want to get I just want to get your opinion of this year's changes to the fees compared to what we've seen in the past. Yeah, it, it feels like it. Uh, I mean, it's a lot more convoluted, obviously. Mm. Um, and I, I wonder why they did that. You know, I, I wonder if it's based on, you know, the feedback that they're getting that it's just fee after fee after fee. Um, although I'm not sure, really sure that they listen, um, you know, to that. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if I found out they, their opinion is they have a captive audience. Um, so it. it it feels like they tried to massage things a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. it's um, this one's going up, but this one's going down, you know, this, you know, it, 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 I think they're trying to, to, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's an effort to be fair about it while also increasing the revenue that they've decided that they need um, revenue increase that they decided that they need, I should say. Um, and they they did make some concessions, um, so we do have to give them a little bit of credit for that. Um, I think ultimately the the story is as usual when we try to figure out why they're doing what they're doing. You know, mm -hmm. it, it usually it, it boils down to what the purpose is and and or what they're trying to avoid or and what they're trying to smooth over. Um, it's it's never usually the knee jerk reactions that that you read and you, and you hear or you may experience yourself individually. Um, it, that's mostly noise. You know, it, it takes a little bit of time to to digest it, um, and and kind of figure out how it fits into 
you know, your overall business operations. Uh, but I always find that, that once you analyze why they're doing what they're doing, um, it'll make a little bit more sense. And, and, uh, and I think as with every, everything, you know, new fees, they apply to everyone. We all have to, to deal with them. No one is exempt, you know, except for, for some of them that, that, you know, you can get stuff waived or, or, um, you know, there, there's a little bit of performance on an individual level that, that can ease the burdens. But for the most part, we all have to deal with this, you know, so it's not mm-hmm. an advantage to, to anyone else. Um, and I think for the most part with all the previous fee changes, it hasn't been as big a deal as it seems initially. And, and it's certainly not as big a deal as the knee jerk reactions are. So that. So lest we you know, be accused of simping for Amazon, if you will, uh, you know, that is that is something I, I don't know, that's something I like to do. And, and something I appreciate about you is that, yes, we can be irritated, you know, because they these happen every year, you know, incessantly. But on the other hand, we're willing to take the time and think about okay, well, why is Amazon doing this? You know, they've got a, they've got a bunch of people with advanced degrees and MBAs and all of that, you know, running around headquarters trying to figure this stuff out, who I would imagine may be an order of magnitude smarter than I am. Uh, and we got we, we to see where Amazon's trying, where are they trying to put the puck? Uh, you know, and we've seen this, we've seen this happen over and over and over again. You know, Amazon started with, well, we will take all of your inventory and we're just going to store it for you. Uh, and, you know, that that's it. That's We're going to store it. We're going to ship it. Just leave it here. Let it collect dust. You know, leave it here for five years if you want. And then if it finally sells, great. Uh, and that changed. You know, they no longer just wanted to be a storage facility for free. And they started with long-term storage fees, which are now called aged inventory surcharges or or whatever they call them now. Uh, And then they made it a little bit more painful because they wanted faster moving product. They wanted the product to be in and out. And we should probably touch on, well, why are they, why are they creating these convoluted fees? Well, uh, I think I know why. And earlier this year, Amazon announced a flywheel approach to uh, inventory distribution. So we got we got to take several disparate things and kind of combine them together. So number one, Amazon this year will surpass both UPS and FedEx to be the largest deliverer of packages in the world. Uh, FedEx is at 3.9 billion, I think. Uh, UPS is at like 5.3 billion. And it's estimated that by the end of this month, December, that Amazon will have delivered 5.9 billion packages, Uh, which is, it's nuts. You know, 10 years ago, they didn't even have their own delivery services. Uh, UPS has been around since they used horse and buggies to deliver packages and FedEx has been around since the eighties. Um, you know, so that was incredible growth. Uh, but they need to make it cheaper. Logistics is the most expensive part of, of having a store, a storefront uh, that people shop from, you know, you're, you could say your product, but Amazon you know, they, they only sell 40% of, you know, products themselves. And an even smaller set of those are products that are private label. So their biggest expense is definitely not product cost. Uh, their biggest expense is going to be getting it to the customer. Uh, so now, on top of wanting to keep clean warehouses, they want to make sure that inventory is distributed properly among those warehouses to get it to the customer as fast as possible and as cheaply as possible. And I think that in Q4, and this has always been the case, but I think this year it's gotten even a little bit more uh, noticeable. 
Amazon's buy box algorithm has favored cheaper and faster to the customer over things like lowest price, which they want to be they want to be known as the lowest price. Obviously, as the Amazon sellers, we know that's not the case. Uh, but what we do know is that I can get almost whatever I want in two days or less. You know, I both of my boys and my wife uh, told me a couple of days ago, they're like, hey, uh, we really want Stanley tumblers. And of course, I went to Amazon first and I'm like, I am not buying uh, these at this price from third party sellers. I'm sorry. I love you guys, but I'm not going to pay the markup when I know better. Uh, and so I went directly to Stanley. Two out of the three tumblers have been delivered. The third one is still sitting in their warehouse and has not even been shipped yet. Uh, you know, and they took like six days to get here in the first place. Uh, you know, I almost wish that I would have ordered from Amazon and paid the markup, marked up price because I would have had all three of them by now and I wouldn't have been hearing it from my youngest, who's who's the one is that's missing. Uh, you know, so that's the direction Amazon's going, and that's the that's the why. Uh, matter of fact, I came across a Jeff Bezos quote, uh, which I thought was apropos to this situation. Uh, and Jeff Bezos says, "I can't imagine that ten years from now, our customers are going to say, I love Amazon." But if only they could deliver my products a little more slowly. Uh, and I think this is I think this is Amazon really trying to iterate on that one idea and the fact that I mean that's what customers want. They want convenience. You know, they want the convenience of stopping at the target on the way home from work, uh, you know, without having to actually do it, which means things need to be there as soon as you think about it rather than having to wait, you know, a week. So. Yeah. We're certainly spoiled. Um, oh, you know, they've, you're they've changed the, the landscape. Um, you know, you, you order from someone else and, it, you know, we know that we have to pay for convenience, you know, so it's, mm -hmm. I've ordered some Christmas gifts from, uh, you know, directly from some companies and, and uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you almost get offended, you know, you almost get angry, you know, cause it's like, what is, taken so long and then you know you kind of have to take a step back and say all right well this <laughs> maybe i'm the unreasonable one you know and the, and the shipping time is is pretty standard uh, absolutely but you know but I, yeah uh, but when they've set the bar uh, you know they change the landscape on us so yeah i mean seriously you know i had to, i had uh i had something the other day that was it was broken and i, I it's something that i absolutely needed uh, and I needed to get a replacement part. Uh, I wasn't going to order off Amazon because I would, um, you know, as an OA seller, I'm always able to find it cheaper. And so I had some really good coupon codes. I had some great cash back. Uh, you know, I got a 30% discount on the products, but that was almost negated because I needed the items quickly and it was either get their free shipping for six days or pay them an extra $20 and get the items in two days. Right. And I did. I paid the 20 bucks to get the items in two days. It made me feel a little bit better that I had had the discount ahead of time. Uh, you know, but in reality, uh, I just paid for prime shipping, essentially. So. Yeah. And think about uh, how, you know, how valuable that Amazon's network is, that they're able to do what they can do so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and just uh, I'm sure there are people out there that are they're doing the same thing that we are. They're shopping at, at directly from other stores. Uh, and, and some of these I had I ordered a, a candle for my wife. She doesn't listen. So I can uh, I can safely uh, <laughs> say that uh, I ordered a candle uh, and I ordered it on. I want to say December 7th. And so they start sending me, of course, they give you the options for expedited shipping and whatnot. And I forget what the business days. I want to say it was five to eight business days with standard shipping, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and that was fine with me. So I placed the order 
And then shortly after receiving the confirmation email that they received my order, they sent me another email that said, hey, it, they made it sound like an alert. I'm kind of, this is kind of shady uh, if, if they're doing what, what I think they're doing. So they sent me an alert and they said, hey, there's an important issue regarding your order. So I, you know, it, it got my attention right away. And they said, we don't know if this is going to be able to be delivered before Christmas. So you have the option to upgrade your shipping for $4.99 to ensure that it's delivered by, and I forget whatever date, you know, they said, we'll, we'll make sure it's there. Uh, you know, so they, they tried to upsell me shipping after the fact. Um, and the item was delivered on December 10th <laughs> after I declined, you know, anyway. So now that's, that's, that's a bit of an upsell, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to supersize, uh, try to get the supersize charge out of you, mm -hmm. um, which I don't appreciate from that company. Um, however, other, other companies do it. They, because they really don't have any idea. It, it's, it's, you know, it's a very fluid and maybe they're, they're, um, you know, maybe it's a little bit of, of fear from the supply chain issues that we we've experienced over the, the last few years, um, that they're not sure, you know, or they're prepping for something unexpected, you know, to delay, um, their delivery system. But look at that shop around and, and, and look at some of these shipping times and, and the, the ranges that they allow for, for themselves to get it to you and compare that to what Amazon can do, you know, within mm -hmm. two days with your prime membership, you know, that's, it, it's really incredible if you, if you think about it, you know, it, it, that, that Amazon has built this logistics network that they have. Um, and it's certainly expensive. So, um, you know, the, these, this isn't vindictive on, on Amazon's uh, part, uh, you know, trying to, to milk more money out of us. You know, there's, um, there's a reason behind it. And they've clearly said that they're, they're still trying to reduce the amount of time that it takes for packages to reach their, their customers. Exactly. Yeah. Which I mean, honestly, and I know this, this is going to be the part where people are like, Oh, well you guys, you know, you guys just forgive Amazon for everything. Uh, you know, but the thing is, is we can get upset by this or we can realize that if Amazon was not doing this, the opportunity either would not be there for Amazon sellers or it would not be nearly as big. It would just be another eBay. I mean, those, right. If we kind of, if we take it out to its logical, you know, end point, that's what it would be. It either would not be there and Amazon would just be a first party company and they would be, you know, I don't know. They'd be jet.com, but still around. Or it would just be another eBay and it would not. And, and Walmart would be the one who was uh, massive. Uh, but the fact that, you know, a couple million sellers can make some extra money or even, you know, full time income or even hundreds of millions of dollars every year on the platform, it really is because of this speed of shipping, I think more than anything else, probably probably even more than the selection. Uh, I yeah. think selection might be a, a close number two, but people don't want to wait, especially when they could go to Target and get the item, or they can stay watching, you know, whatever show they're watching and just order from their phone and have it tomorrow or heck I've had some things delivered same day, you know? So, yeah, yeah absolutely. And more and more items so, are going to be delivered. You know, well, think exactly. about the, the, com the complaints that uh, take it on to, uh, to a brick and mortar uh, situation. You know, everybody got mad at, at Walmart and the, and the proliferation of, of the stores because they were, they were choking out mom and pop stores. Mm -hmm. Right. So now, that trend hasn't stopped. You know, Walmart is still expanding. Revenues are still going up. Uh, it, but think about the decisions that you had to make as a consumer. You know, if you want to support the mom and pop shop, it's going to be smaller than the Walmart Supercenter, of course, yep. which means your selection is more limited. So you either have to deal with that and just go with a limited selection of things and not get 
the exact things that you want all the time. Or you could go to Walmart and have an embarrassment of riches available to you. Um, and, and basically everything, you know, it's, it's kind of, that's the brick and mortar dynamic that, that Amazon has and the advantage that they have, you know, it's basically the same thing. It's, it's, you know, you know, people are making that decision, the same decision that you had to make with your expedited shipping. You know, you had the discount, but you'd have to wait. So, you know, people are saying, let's just pay a little bit more from Amazon because I know I'll have it in no more than two days. And that's, Mm -hmm. We, we can't forget how valuable Amazon is, you know, as a marketplace, you know, that, that we get to sell on, you know, that's, um, you know, it's easy to get, uh, um, you know, d- disgruntled about this stuff and, and kind of take for granted how, how valuable the marketplace is and, and the reason that we're able to make the incomes and, and the streams of revenue that we, that we are. Mm-hmm. Now, before we move on, there are two two more things I want to bring up. One is the the takes that I have seen from other sellers. They have varied from I haven't even I didn't even know there was a fee coming, all the way to this is it. This is how we go out. Uh, you know, game over for arbitrage sellers. Game over for wholesale sellers. Uh, which I think that's that's far too far too much of a of a take. Uh, I think if, I think it'll be somewhere in between, where maybe we see some maybe we see some higher fees a little bit, uh, but I definitely don't think this is the end of the road for sellers. No, it's um. Excuse me. Now, third-party sellers take up, make up too much of the catalog. Mm-hmm. Way too much of the catalog. So let's talk a little bit about what Amazon says is going to happen, the overall impact. Uh, and, I, of course, I, I highlighted a bunch of things here. Uh, but Amazon states that after all of these changes, and they're, they're talking about all the fees that are, that are coming, all the fee changes, After these changes, we expect that sellers will see an average increase of 15 cents in fees per unit sold. So that's going to, of course, take into account or what they're expecting to take into account are the increased fees for low inventory level fees, uh, any aged inventory storage fee changes, monthly inventory storage fee changes, fulfillment changes, and inbound placement service fees, okay? So it takes all of these kind of convoluted fees and and tries to put it into a a neat little number and tie a little bow on this for you. Uh, And they go on to say, of course, this is significantly lower than the increases announced by other logistics providers. Uh, However, we also expect that there will be many sellers who will see a decrease in the average fees Paid to Amazon per unit sold. Now, I wish that they would have said we expect this percent of sellers to see lower fees, or we expect these types of sellers to see lower fees. Uh, and here's one of the the big gripes that I have with Amazon. One, whoever writes this, if you happen to be watching our our little podcast, um, I don't know how you write these with a straight face. Uh, But two, Amazon is supposed to be a right first company. So if you go into a meeting at Amazon, you're supposed to have uh, a a document laid out about your idea. Uh, No PowerPoints or anything like that. Uh, And it's also supposed to be the length of time it takes to eat a pizza. All right. So they're supposed to sit down and read these six page documents before they have a meeting. Uh, And they're supposed to be clear communication. Uh, and Amazon lacks that when it comes to offering communication to the sellers. Uh, so that's that's a huge gripe that I have. Yeah. They, uh, why do they always put that that passive little whataboutism in there? 
you know, like, hey, we're increasing the fees, but it, it's way less than the other guys. <laughs> you know, like, I, I hate that angle, and, and they've used it so many times. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is, you know, um, you know, there's lies, there's damn lies, and there's statistics, and I'm guessing that they were able to cherry pick uh, the logistics providers that they looked at, you know? So of course right. uh, the numbers are going to be in their favor. Now, one other thing that it says in this, uh, in this love note to Amazon sellers, which uh, reinforces, I, you know, what I think my thoughts are uh, is it says that we will focus on how we partner together to inbound and place inventory across our network. Uh, and so I think we're going to see more and more of a push to see inventory distributed in the places where Amazon thinks it will get to the customer the fastest, um, which, you know, that will be a good thing, uh, even if we don't like it at first. But this is, you know, this brings us to the inbound placement service fee. Um, this is... This is not something new necessarily. I, I know it seems new, uh, but they have been doing uh, s- they've been doing this sort of at least for preferred placement or whatever they called it before. Uh, but now there are going to be two programs. It looks like there's going to be a premium service, uh, which is where you can send your inventory to a single receiving center or fulfillment center. And Amazon then spreads your inventory across their network on your behalf for a fee. Now, that has, that has existed in the past in one form or another, actually in multiple forms. There was, there was like, I don't know, ultra premium and then I don't know what they called the levels. But there's one you had to like get invited to and there's one you could enroll in. Uh, now, what seems to me to be changing is there's really only going to be two tiers now. There's going to be this premium level, and it seems like you'll be able to create a shipment and everything's just going to go to one place. You have three items of this, you have five items of that, and so on. It'll all just go to one place. It's not going to get split up. That's what it sounds like. Then you're going to have the discounted service. And with the discounted service, you're going to send your inventory to multiple inbound locations yourself for a reduced fee or no fee. So this is this is actually something I really don't like because you have no idea until you create the shipment how much either one's going to cost you. Okay, like, well, you know how much the premium service is going to cost because you can do that pretty easily. Small standard is going to be 21 to 30 cents. Uh, Large standard, 12 ounces or less, is going to be 23 to 34 cents. But if you choose the discounted service for those same exact items, you can receive a discount up to 100% based on the number of shipments and inbound locations. So my guess is, is that the larger the shipments and the more distributed your inventory, the larger their discount will be for the discount service. Um, the problem is, is you're going to pay for it one way or the other. You're going to pay for it in increased inbound shipping costs for the discounted okay. service because of multiple locations. And uh, you may have to, if, if I'm in Florida and I ship from here, maybe I have some stuff go to South Carolina. Maybe I have some stuff go up to uh, Ohio, maybe I have some stuff go over to Texas to be able to, to distribute things. Well, South Carolina is not going to cost me too much. Ohio is going to cost me a little bit more. Texas usually costs me a little bit more than shipping to Ohio. <coughs> so this to me is one of those, you're going to have to figure out on the front end, which one is better for you. Is it better to pay Amazon the fee or is it better to, you know, pay for the items to be distributed? And another another level of complexity to that is what you sell. If, if your shipments are 
small and dense or small and heavy, uh, you're not necessarily going to have to worry about dimensional weight. But if I decide that I want to get heavy into, that is so weird. If you're watching YouTube, uh, I don't know what kind of AI StreamYard is using, uh, but they just decided to randomly let it go off in the background sometimes. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to open up a ticket about that. Um, but one of the things you're going to have to think about is, let's say I decide to get into uh, plush, you know, real heavy. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to become a, a squish Molo distributor. Well, now my dimensional inbound shipping charges are going to be incredibly high, uh, because I'm going to have large boxes with very low weight. Uh, you're going to see this a little bit with the shoe sellers. They're going to find out that the dimensional weight is going to cost more, especially if they're using the discounted service. Now, the only good thing that is coming from this, in, in my opinion, is that when you create a shipping plan, they do say that you're going to see a cost et estimate for each available inbound placement option. Uh, now, I don't know how Inventory Lab or any other inbound shipping software is going to handle that, uh, but I would imagine in the Send to Amazon, uh, it'll all be right there for you. Uh, and then the other thing is you're not going to be charged this NBA in, or this FBA inbound placement service fee until 45 days after your shipment is received. So it seems to me like what they're trying to do there is, okay, well, we, we know that this is going to change the way that you do inbound, but we want to give you an opportunity to sell through that inventory uh, before we claw back the this new fee that's coming your way right so um we do we do control a bit of this right so that's that's immediate mm -hmm. bright side is we do we are able to customize uh this fee a little bit and the one thing when i was reading through this part the one interesting thing that popped into my head was uh my mastermind and i have two there are two sellers that have quite a bit of experience, um, years and years. Um, and they both uh, white knuckle their premium placement service. They will not give it up. Oof, um, okay. They, they happily pay it uh, because of how much easier it makes uh, their, their shipments. Um, and, and they're the, and the one guy is, is doing, I don't know. He, he a lot of volume, um, almost a million dollar seller. Um, and it's all coming. It's probably 90 plus percent out of his house. You know, he's, um, uh, actually I, I think it's a hundred percent out of his house. So wow. paying the premium placement and it, it, it makes a lot of sense when it, when you talk to him because he's able to, you know, buy his inventory, he brings it into the house and it's all going to the one fulfillment center. He knows that for sure. So right off the jump, he can grab whatever box that he wants, whatever he thinks is appropriate, you know, and he, he's got it down, you know, what sizes are, are likely going to fit or whatever. But you just, you tape up the box, you open it up, you start filling it, you stop at whatever weight, you move on to the next box. And it's simply just a quick process like that. You don't have to think about cutting boxes down. You know, I mean, you can just stop it and move to the next one because it's all getting lumped in uh, and, and go into the same place. Um, and even though in both of these sellers extensively, we've talked about it, they've had major, major issues with the fulfillment center that they got assigned to them. Um, and, and we're talking like 20 plus days for the fulfillment center to actually get their, their products into receiving if they claim that they received them at all, you know, there, there's missing oh. shipment issues and stuff. Right. So even through all these headaches, they, they will not, I mean, they're so reluctant to give up the premium placement because it, whether they're grandfathered in or whatever the old policy was, if they give it up, they can't go back. So they, and they have hung on for dear life. And now everyone's going to get this at, I mean, honestly, 
what seems like a fairly good rate. You know, it, it's it's a it's a table depending on size of items. You know, but there was a time when I was paying extra for everything to go to one place because the convenience and the time saved is is massive. So I guess, Chris, what what's your overall feeling on on kind of this inbound placement service fee, or, or have you thought about, I guess, what you'll be doing? Um, I I think we need to see it in action on this one. Um, and that's uh, and it kind of sounds like a cop out, but um, I think we need to determine just how valuable the premium service will be. You know, because mm-hmm. it, if it's if it's the type of thing where it stays to how it is now, because when I do my shipments, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, it's going to go to three, sometimes a fourth fulfillment center. If it stays that way and that's what the discounted service is, I'm OK with that. You know, I can I can kind of make a decision um, from there, you know, and that's that has value. However, if it changes and now the discounted service is making me send it to seven or eight different fulfillment centers that's going to that that changes the value of the premium service for me mm-hmm. so i i think we kind of we, we need to see what happens uh once this is in action you know to actually determine the value and and, and kind of assess it from there um, yeah. i do like that it, it's it's customizable for us you know so we can control it uh, yeah, you know, you can absolutely. Get in, if you're in a groove or something like that, you know, I could easily see scenarios where the premium service is worth it, you know, because you can just mm-hmm. churn stuff out and you're being incredibly consistent. And, uh, you know, if FC transfers never bothered you much in the first place, you know, like maybe that was kind of like the training program for, for what uh, what the premium service is going to be, um, you know, but if you're so consistent that FC transfer doesn't bother you and you're just constantly just keeping your flow of inventory going in. It may not bother you, you know, and you can yeah. make it up in volume. Yeah, that would be, I mean, I, that, it'd be interesting to see how this plays out, uh, especially for, I think, some larger sellers. I don't know. I, I, I'd want to kind of, I just want to take the temperature of a lot of people, and which I, I would imagine we're going to get some, we're probably going to get a lot of opinions on social media once it kicks in anyway. Uh, sure. And I don't know. If Amazon could figure out the inbound logistics like they are the outbound, it would, uh, to me, it would be worth paying the the fee almost no matter, every time, you know. Uh, right. and, and, and if you're using a prep center, it would probably make them a heck of a lot happier too uh, because they've just got to fill up the boxes to 48 pounds and, and that's it. Yep. So yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that works out. I I'm hoping for good things, but I'm not going to hold my breath. <laughs> Fulfillment fee changes is the next thing coming along, and uh, I think this has some some good and some bad. So starting on this one starts on February fifth, and I'm, I'm I don't know why Amazon is staggering all these changes. I, they ought to just shock us. Uh, you know, on one day, uh, but they're staggering these out. So on February 5th, uh, fulfillment fee changes are coming into effect. The small standard size tier is now going to be measured at intervals of two ounces and the large standard size tier from one pound to 20 pounds will be measured at an interval of four ounces. It wasn't quite that granular before. Uh, However, what I did read, and sorry, my notes are large on this particular one. Um, oh, fulfillment fees for apparel are, let's see, they're going to introduce large, bulky, and extra large size tiers where those did not exist before. Uh, they are going to reduce some of the fees for uh, clothing under certain prices. So that's a positive, and that's, I mean, that's obviously due to uh, the rise of Sheen and Temu, Timu, I don't even know. I've never been on either one of those websites. Um, but, so that's a, that's a positive. 
And these fulfillment fees are coming down a bit. So let me find my size tiers here. Let's see where it's at. So for, and well, actually, let me ask you this. On average, what do you think the average size of what you sell is? Or, or can you even do that with the, the cross-section of, of things that you sell? Yeah, I mean, most of the time when I'm sourcing, uh, you know, if I'm using software, I'm going to eliminate oversized. Okay. Which, um, which I, you know, if I'm oversized products, I'd, I'd rather be called oversized than large bulky. Yeah, I did. So <laughs> right. They're not. Uh, they're not being complimentary by the name change. That's for sure. But uh, you know, I tend to, I tend to avoid the oversized. Um, mm-hmm. Mostly because it, it's it, like my two prep centers. I have New Hampshire and and Montana, and um, uh, shipping from Montana is its own animal. <laughs> so. Um, that gets adventurous, you know, sometimes it'll, it'll go from the entire country top to bottom in a matter of hours, it seems like, and be in Texas. Uh, and then sometimes my shipments, uh, take a five day siesta in Salt Lake city. So, um, and it can get expensive, you know, there's, um, you know, there's nothing close to that area. So, um, you know, depending on where the stuff's going. So, so I try to, I try to rein that in because there, there is, uh, uh, there's some landmines, um, that I can run into, uh, that I try to avoid. So most of my stuff is, is, would fall into the large standard category, I would say. Um, seems like, cause that's, that tends to be higher price stuff, which, mm-hmm. you know, the numbers, numbers look better on, on that sort of stuff. Um, you know, but I do a fair share of beauty too. So, um, I, you know, I have plenty in the small standard too, but th- those are the vast majority is in those two categories. Okay. So I'm going to stick with the small standard because we don't have time to go through every single change here. Uh, but in the small standard category right now, or well, let's say January 15, 2024 through February 4th of 2024, uh, it's four ounces or, per, or less four to eight ounces, eight to 12, and then 12 to 16. Uh, and we'll just stick with the four ounces or less here. Uh, it's 419 is what your fulfillment fee is. 419 for something that's under four ounces. I like selling beauty products. A, a ton of beauty is under four ounces. 419 is, is what I'm going to see a ton of. Now, if it's two ounces or less come February 5th, through April 14th, uh, that price is going to stay the same at 419. But if it's two to four ounces, it's going to go to $4.25. Now, this is just from February 5 to April the 14th. Okay. On April the 15th, two ounces or less is going to now be 403. So that's going to drop whatever that is. I, we don't do public math here. Two to four ounces is going to go from 425 down to 409. So both of those fulfillment fees will be less than what they were in the beginning of the year at 419. So that's a positive, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little more granular, a little more fees that calculators like RevSeller, SellerAmp, uh, Scoutify, ScanPower are going to have to figure out, uh, but it's coming down. And here's where I have a little bit of a gripe with Amazon sellers. I've not seen one person say, oh, hey, here's a positive change that's happening in 2024. This is positive, you know. It's going to get negated by some of the other things, (laughs) you know, but we can find a silver lining every now and again. Uh, yeah. Well, how important does uh, does higher end beauty become now? Oh, absolutely. You know. Yeah. And, and and think about it. We're not doing public math, but I mean that's that's at least a a few percentage points of a drop. You know, it's, a, it's somewhere between. Mm-hmm. It sounds like a three to four percent drop. And think about um, 
think about how you you know you look for cash back and whatnot. You know, we're grinding for for every percentage point that we can get. So that's not insignificant. No, yeah. not at all. And there's some now, really nice selling prices on beauty products. Four ounces. There of are. I was. I know this is going to be a hazmat example, but I was. I was looking yesterday. I was looking for some items that uh, would be good to merchant fulfill uh, that have you know risen in price by uh, like fifteen percent or more in one day. Okay, uh, you know, figuring I would find some things that. Uh, maybe the demand has gotten much higher, uh, either just because we're so close to the you know, Christmas when we're recording this, or because the number of sellers has dropped, or whatever that reason is. And a lot of the things in that area were beauty products. They were they were perfumes, which made tons of sense to me because it's almost husband Christmas shopping season. It's getting uh, close. It's getting real close. Uh, and so I was like, okay, that makes a ton of sense. So, yeah, I think high-priced beauty will be uh, will be a great a great thing to be in. Unfortunately, we did just have another another brand bite the dust for resellers. Yeah, which I was always surprised why Chanel wasn't in the premium beauty category anyway, which, which is more restricted, you know, like. And not yeah. that I'm a connoisseur of, you know, the hierarchy of uh, uh, beauty royalty, but Chanel seemed up there. Yeah, I would think so. And Dior's not not in there yet, which also surprises me. And those right. are two that I'm like, that, that just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, now, one of the other things that I think some people will find as a positive and some people will think is a net negative um, is the the ships in product packaging program, uh, and we're going a little out of order from our our notes here, but um, this could be a good thing for Amazon sellers. You know, they're going to be yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna use the example of the the long term hold Lego sellers. A lot of those people are buying Legos that they know are going to retire or they expect to retire. They're holding on to them at their homes or in storage units. They're waiting a year, maybe two years, and then they're selling the items. You know, and you can have a $40 Lego set go from $40 retail to $150, $190 once it's retired. And that's when they start selling them. A lot of those sellers, because they know that they're selling to collectors, are putting things in their own boxes. You know, they're, they're putting some over packaging on the boxes. Those would be items that are going to be eligible to be shipped in product packaging. It seems. Uh, and for those items, you're going to get a discount, uh, for, for those things. It's not a huge discount. Uh, two ounces or less is going to be four cents. Uh, 10 to 12 ounces is going to be six cents. Uh, if we go to large standard size and talk about something like a, a Lego product, you're going to be looking at 11 to 12 cents. Um, you know, so it's not a huge amount of money, but uh, it might it might stack up. And I'm not sure what else is going to to qualify. That, that's the part that doesn't. It's not really clear. Like for example, if I if I poly bag a, a supplement, you know, can they can they ship it that way, or can they, you know, is it going to count if it ships in a uh, a poly mailer from Amazon? Uh, is that going to get me the the ships in product packaging discount? Um, that part I, I'm not clear on. If that's the case, though, for some sellers, this could end up being a lot of savings, especially if they're high volume sellers and they don't have to put their own over packaging on their products. Yeah, yeah definitely. This is another one where, where clarification will, will definitely help. Um, my, I, I went negative. Uh, my first reaction, um, because I worry about the returns. Um, yes. I, I think it's going to increase the amount of unsellable 
uh, returns. I would imagine you're probably right. Uh, I. It's not like UPS and USPS are known to handle things with care, uh, whether you put the sticker on there or not. So I, I can definitely see that if something is not getting put into a box, it's going to get damaged, especially especially things with pumps, you know, lotions, some shampoos, uh, cleaning products, etc. I mean, they're all going to get busted unless you start making sure that they go out in a box or, or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I think I this think could be good. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I think there's going to be a lot of good and bad with this. Yeah, I agree. I, I think we're going to see a, a whole lot more uh, eBay listings with uh, those little odd squares cut out of the cardboard boxes. Yeah. Uh, all right. We've got, we've just got two more. I, I know this is, this is probably a little dry of an episode, but I don't know. I haven't really seen anybody try to go through every single one of these to help people understand. So I, I think we're doing a, we're doing a public service here, Chris. Uh, yeah. and, and it makes our other episodes look all the more exciting. Right. Now, the next one is monthly inventory storage fee and aged inventory surcharge changes. Uh, this one was was good news, in my opinion, although this is not really a fee that I think too many people even pay very close attention to. Because if your inventory is moving at a good enough pace, this really is, has never been that much money, in my opinion. Uh, I'm sure that this will be more helpful to uh, you know, private label sellers, maybe wholesale sellers who are keeping 45 or 90 days worth of inventory at Amazon. Uh, but I don't know. My inventory storage fees are, are normally around the 1% to 2% tops. I don't know if, if you ever pay attention to that metric uh, and where you're at. Not really. It's it's not anything that bothers me. I mean, I'll, I'll take a look at the number and the charges. Um, I I've just kind of become so tuned to, uh, you know, kind of sixty to ninety. You know, just getting a mind shift as far as inventory. You know, I'd, I've kind of uh, mm -hmm. I tried to dial it in more. You know, to, as far as sell through and 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 kind of turn over that inventory. So. Um, I like to, if I'm doing a good job at that part of it, I don't really have to pay attention to this part. Yeah. That's how I, that's how I look at it. Yeah, I would agree with you there, but starting April 1st off peak monthly inventory storage fees, which is January through September are going to be reduced nine cents per cubic foot for standard size products. Um, there's not going to be any change to off peak monthly inventory storage fees for large bulky or big boned items uh, and uh, or extra large. Um, those are not, or those are not going to change. So essentially what you're going to see is uh, prior to April 1, 2024, 87 cents per cubic foot uh, for standard size. And after April 1, it's going to be 78 cents per cubic foot. Uh, zero change to peak storage charges. So I'm going to stay right at the $2.40 per cubic foot. Um, I don't know. To me, it's not, I don't know. This is nice. It's, it's nice to see a fee come down, uh, but I, I really don't think that this is going to move the needle for very many people one way or the other. Yeah, maybe some of the massive sellers are going to see something that is uh, recognizable in the form of a few more dollars every pay period. But I think for most people, it's going to be a, they don't really care. Yeah. I think what's most likely to happen is we're going to forget about this, you know, like the specifics of it. So mm -hmm. when the, when the peak fee gets announced, 
it's going to be that much higher of a percentage of what we're used to. <laughs> so I think I think right. we'll freak out about it all over again down the road. Oh, absolutely. Um, oh, the aged inventory uh, surcharge changes. Uh, this is one that I thought was interesting. Uh, they're going to start, let's see, uh, inventory that is between 271 to 365 days is going to increase. Uh, but surcharges will remain unchanged for inventory stored between 181 to 270 and inventory stored 365 days or more. Um, I mean, honestly, I don't know why anybody is paying aged inventory storage fees. Uh, so again, I just I don't know that this is really something that's going to move the needle. We date our inventory. We don't marry it. Uh, and it should be out of there by the time your those kind of fees come into play, in my opinion. Yeah, I don't, if this I can't imagine this is a a, a huge income generator for them. Um, but I mean, if you're getting to the point where your inventory has been sitting there for nine months, you know, unless that's a part of your business model, which I'm not familiar with, and and if that's the case, I apologize uh, uh, for the pain you're going through. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but really, I, you know, I don't see a difference between day 271 and day 365. You know, that's, I've already, I've long been in the mode of liquidation, you know, if I ever get to that point. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And if, if you do have, if you're listening to this and you do have inventory at that age, Chris and I have gone over this in past episodes about uh, opportunity cost, sunk costs, and I would highly suggest you go and listen to those uh, and learn about what those are because it, I think I think that alone will change your mind on how you manage aged inventory. Uh, just doesn't make doesn't make a lot of sense in most cases. All right, right. so now we're to the part of the show where and we kept this to the end for a reason uh, that everyone is talking about uh, the low level inventory or low inventory level fee. Uh, and the way that I've seen it described is, Oh, well, Amazon charges us, uh, us if we have too much inventory uh, and now they're going to charge us if we don't have enough inventory, which yeah, I understand that on its face that's a true statement but i think that it's uh i don't necessarily think that's a fair uh i don't think that's fair in my opinion uh you know I, you got to pay for store imagine imagine having to have your own warehouse you know to to store you know 6 months worth of inventory and and what you would be paying compared to what you have to pay amazon but this is the fee that I think is the most difficult to understand. Uh, the wording on it is is very tough, and of course, this is the this is the fee that most people or that some people, uh, some people who I never thought would have said it, uh, are now saying they think it might be the end of arbitrage sellers and wholesale sellers, which uh, I think is a, a knee jerk reaction uh, and not the correct one, in my opinion. Um, so Amazon is going to apply a low inventory level fee to standard size products with consistently low inventory relative to customer demand. So, and the reason, again, the reason they're doing this is because when sellers carry low inventory relative to the number of units that get shipped out to customers, Amazon's unable to properly distribute it across their delivery network. So if we go back to the beginning of the show, we're seeing the same thing reiterated once again from Amazon. Amazon's looking for hot, nasty speed on delivery to customers. And that's what this is, is going to be all about. Now, this low level or this low inventory level fee will only ap apply if a product's historical inventory levels 
relative to historical demand, which they are calling historical days of supply, is below 28 days. If eligible, the low inventory level fee will be added to the FBA fulfillment fee for its shipped units. Okay. Now, before we start digging into what's it going to cost and, and all of that, uh, there are some exceptions to this rule. Okay. So the exceptions are uh, the fee only applies to standard size products if the historical days of supply is less than 28 days. Uh, the low, low inventory level fee will not apply to new professional sellers for the first 365 days after the first inventory received date. Uh, so for your first year, you get a, you get a break, okay? Uh, which is, that's nice. You know, new sellers don't have to figure this all out. Uh, new to FBA parent products for the first 180 days after the first inventory received date. Uh, sellers need to be enrolled in FBA new selection to get this benefit. Uh, so if you go and create a listing on Amazon for a product that you bring to the platform, the parent level, ASIN, or sorry, the parent level, yeah, ASIN, is not going to be charged any uh, fees for the first 180 days, okay? Uh, and then finally, products that are auto-replenished by Amazon warehousing and distribution. I don't think that will apply to most people who listen to this show. Uh, you're just, you're not, you're not using just-in-time uh, distribution from Amazon to, to get things into warehouses uh, if you're an arbitrage seller. Chris, what is I get? What's your first take on this, and then we'll dive into what this is going to cost the Amazon seller. Uh, the optics are bad on this one. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. if uh, if I'm an Amazon apologist, uh, I am fresh out of material. So, uh, <laughs> to to summarize it, it sucks. Uh, that's the show. Good night, folks. Uh, no, <laughs> but <laughs> um. Yeah, there, there's this one's confusing um, because we can't even get the details right. You know, um, like we were talking pre-show, you know, we we're trying to figure out what applies on an individual seller level and, and what applies on an ASIN level. Um, even that part of it isn't clear. Um, you know, the, the, the one thing. The one thing that that I kind of justified it in my head on, on how it might be okay is th the fees will be averaged out. Right. So, yes. so not, it, not everything, you know, like you're, you're not going to be charged if you don't fall into this low inventory bracket, you know? So, right. so there is a, there is a mitigation to it, you know? Um, so right there, you know, you can't just look at the, the you know, small standard and, and be like, all right, slap 89 cents on every item. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, most people, most sellers are, are, are probably going to sell the bulk of their their own inventory without these fees applying. So um, it does get diluted. Yeah. So, yeah, I so I don't think that is the one good thing. But you're one hundred percent right. The this looks horrible. It makes I mean this looks this this reads like rocket surgery. You know, I cannot make heads or tails of it. Uh, you know, we're gonna apply this low inventory level fee uh when sellers carry low inventory relative to shipped units. You know, words are important. And so when I read when sellers carry low inventory relative to shipped units, I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be at the ASIN level. If Amazon tells me that historically these items are in stock, you know, from 15 sellers on average, and there's enough stock to take care of the next 45 days, then I shouldn't have to worry about it. But, oh, well, you know, this item sells so quickly 
and not enough people get their hands on it. So we're going to charge a little bit more because it cannot be shipped around like everything else can. You know, that I, I don't something like that doesn't seem so bad to me. But if it's now, well, this is all based on you and how much stock you carry as a seller, not as sellers, then it, it seems even more difficult to figure out. Now, I'm confusing myself just talking about it. Uh, so I, I don't I don't know. There really, really needs to be some clarification on this uh, because it I, I don't know if anybody really understands it fully uh, the way that Amazon's written it, in my opinion. Yeah, it's it, this is the one I, I'm most anxious to read the clarification on. Um, yeah, because I I want to say what's the well. Let me pose this question: What's the number one complaint that you've heard about this fee? Is it, is there something that you've heard more common than than? Uh, probably the complexity. You know, how is how is my calculator going to figure this out is what I've seen quite a bit of. I The most common that I've heard is people thinking that this uh, is a major obstacle for test buys. OK. Um, I, I've heard that a, a couple different times and, and. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it is because I, I think, you know, if, if you're going to test buy with five units. And, and this is, I, we're not going to be able to figure this out because we don't do public math. But, you know, it, the fact that it it just got there is going to skew your 90 day number if they're even able to calculate it. You know, because right. the, the one question is, what does, what does zero mean in their eyes, according to this fee? Mm -hmm. You know, because if they're, if they're looking at historical days of supply, you know, they say they're going to take the daily inventory, average daily inventory units divided by the average daily shipped unit. So if you're dividing by zero and there's no shipped units, what does zero mean? Right. Yeah. You know, I, and that's, that's a, so that's another reason why to me, this seems like an ASIN level issue rather than an individual seller issue, because how can they figure that out? I mean, Amazon knows, and I know, I know that a lot of sellers think that, you know, that we work in this little gray area where Amazon doesn't know that we exist or, or it's just, it's spoken about in hushed tones behind closed doors uh, that people are doing arbitrage. But I mean, come on, <laughs> a bunch of us are on Twitter uh, and, you know, in, in Facebook groups and we see Ron from Seller Help. Uh, you know, comment on on plenty of posts. They know that arbitrage exists. They know that arbitrage is flourishing on their platform, uh, and they know what we're doing. So, I don't know that that's the part that doesn't make sense to me because if I hop on a listing I've never sold in the past that's been selling for years, how does that how does that equation work with with no data from me? Oh, that it's it's got to be right. listing wide, you know, or at least that's what that's what makes sense to to this the way my brain works anyway. Yeah, and the, and that would be consistent with account health issues because we're we're certainly penalized on a seller level based on jumping on a listing that's been around for ten years, uh, even though we didn't make the listing, you know, and it, when it comes to IP complaints and trademark and all that stuff. Exactly. So, I mean, I guess worst case scenario, you just figure that there's going to be somewhere between an 89 cent and a dollar 11 fee added onto what you sell, depending on, you know, what size category it's in. My guess is, is that down the road, this becomes even more granular. Uh, and it goes from small standard, large standard, large, uh, large standard or oversize 
and it, they start charging this based on the two ounce, you know, that they they do for fulfillment fees eventually. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't, know. I, I don't know how calculators are gonna gonna handle this. I don't know, you know, if it's gonna be really be much of a big deal anyway, unless you, you know, unless you sell on listings that take a long time to sell out and you carry low amounts of, of inventory on the regular basis. Um, I happen to know some sellers who like their average sales rank across their catalog is like 350,000 and they just carry like, you know, 1500 SKUs. Uh, you know, how does it affect them compared to the people who are trying to sell, you know, 50 pairs of Nike socks every day? I don't know. Well, I, I think it, it it's going to affect more in the middle. You know, it, the, the way I take this is um, we're going to have to pay more attention to our test buys um, mm-hmm. or, you know, the, or the sellers that, that have adopted the, the inch deep mile wide philosophy. You know, it, we're obviously going to have to, and that's, it's kind of a, a, a statement that applies to everything when, when it can, you know, this entire episode but we're gonna have to pay more attention because it it only gets the way i see it 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 gets dicier when you're when you're in the middle of selling your inventory you know like Mm -hmm. say if if you bought 10 units and and you haven't sold any yet or you know you just sold one you know the, the the units that you sell is the denominator in the equation Right. So the the lower that number is, the higher your days of supply, according to Amazon, is going to be. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you if you sent in ten and you only sold one, logic tells you that you've got plenty of days of supply, right? Because you've only you've only had one. It's only once that bottom number starts getting bigger, and now if you sell through five of your ten. Now you've got to decide. I think there's going to be a tipping point that you, that sellers are going to have to determine. Okay, do I quickly liquidate this before my 30 day number hits the zone and I start hitting this fee, or is it time to replenish? You know, do I need to go and get 30, 50 units of this and make a go? Right. So it, it it may actually end up fine tuning our replant strategy, you know, yeah. if that's the case, if that's, you know, if we're able to, to monitor it and there's nothing bad is going to happen from sellers paying more attention to their test buys, you know, and, and their replenishment yeah. levels. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, we can't really go into it all in, in this show, but I would suggest that you go and, and read all this stuff because it, they do give some examples, you know, like, well, what if you're like a bookseller, you know, or, or what about, um, you know, what about items that are seasonal and so on? So right. there are ways to figure that all out. It, it looks like uh, all the tables look like a, a calculus book, which that means I'm not going to understand any of it, um, you know, but they, they have kind of laid it, laid it out as much as they, I guess, are going to. Uh but I mean, honestly, we're just we're not going to know until this fee starts hitting, uh, and I would imagine that we'll right. we'll figure it out pretty quickly. But I, I think the one major thing to take away from this is Amazon wants us to be they want us to be business owners. They they want us to run lean businesses with the proper amount of inventory and and things like that. And you know, it's where it seems that faster and faster uh, we're moving toward the this is no longer for eBay sellers this is for people who want to run tight inventory based businesses uh which i mean we've known for a long time it's just amazon is really starting to push us in that direction these days or at least that's what it seems like to me yeah, and and they have to, you know, if they want to get the delivery speeds to where they want, you know, if they want drones dropping packages from the sky within a few hours of when it's ordered, uh, they need to have 
supply. They need to know exactly what it is and, and they need to be able to anticipate it uh, in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, uh, you know what this is, Ed, you know where the real nightmare is, is if you audit your your fees and everything you know like <laughs> this the the biggest uh windfall maybe for those companies that handle you know reimbursements and 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 getting uh getting incorrect fees uh that are charged to sellers uh that may be the biggest uh uh boost to business out of this whole thing oh absolutely and whoever figures out how to audit the low inventory level fees where they should be charged and where they shouldn't be charged will probably make a killing yeah. um you know, so I don't know. It's, I think the rollout of this is going to suck in my opinion. I, I don't think, I don't think anyone's going to be ready for it. I have been massively surprised by the number of people who have seen, maybe they don't read the news section of seller central uh, or gloss over anything when it comes to fee changes that, that is on social media. Um, I, I don't know. And then, of course, there are other people who are just like, well, this is the end, and I don't believe them either. I think this is just a, it, just time for us to tighten up as sellers. Uh, and I don't know. If, if the thing that I've preached for so long, going an inch deep and a mile wide, has to be rethought, then I'll come up with a new strategy, and I'll start talking about that. Uh, but I don't think it's time for people to worry and, uh, you know, cash in the chips and move on to greener pastures because I don't think that those greener pastures exist quite yet. Uh, I know that there's big talk about Walmart and stuff like that, but I also see some of the troubles that people have over there. And I'm like, yeah, I remember when Amazon was going through those growing pains. Sure. Um, it, it feels complimentary at best. It doesn't feel like a, a out and out replacement. Um, yeah. You know, I, and I think the, the the thing to keep in mind with this whole thing, and, and it it's confusing, um, read through it to, to be slightly less confused. You know, you, you certainly won't, you could read through the entire thing and, and you certainly won't have a full grasp on it. Um, don't get that mis misconception, but um, it, it feels like there's enough here and it's, it's the positive to being convoluted is smarter sellers are going to figure out a path to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's going to be a sweet spot where, you know, the, this is what we need and, and this is what you need to have on stock. And this is, you know, um, this is your restock rates and, and, and whatnot. It, somebody's going to find the most profitable or, you know, the, the lowest fee strategy through this whole thing. You know, I think there's, it, it's kind of like a maze and, and, you know, we don't have it figured out yet, but, I firmly believe that it, it will be figured out and, and there will be a way to um, make this, the impact of these fees um, as minimal as possible. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, that was, I don't know. My, my brain hurts a little bit after that episode. Uh, that was a, it's a lot harder than asking, asking people questions and getting them to answer them for us. Uh, but as we always do, at the end of the show, there is a quote of the week. Uh, and this week is a, uh, is a show favorite. It's James Clear. Uh, you know, if there, is, uh, if there is a show favorite, it's probably him. Uh, but he says, the ultimate form of preparation is not planning for a specific scenario, but a mindset that can handle uncertainty. Uh, and the long and short of it, in my opinion, is that we we don't really know exactly how much impact this new fee structure is going to have on us until the fees start showing up in our reports. And, but we can prepare ourselves for this uncertainty, which, I mean, honestly, it goes against human nature. Human nature craves certainty. It's why we have routines. It's it's why we like you know things in certain places. Uh, but as entrepreneurs, as business owners, that's not what we get paid for. We get paid for building that parachute on the way out of the plane. Uh, and so it's going to take some time for the market to shift, but it, it will. Uh, I don't think arbitrage, I don't think wholesale, and I certainly don't think PL are, are going anywhere. 
I think margins could be impacted for some time, but I know that you know the people who can't handle the changes will leave for what they think are greener pastures. Uh, and those who are willing to be in an uncertain position for a, a time, I think will wait it out and they'll, they'll ultimately be rewarded uh, because complexity, I don't know, complexity usually means that uh, there's fewer people who try something out. Uh, and those who do reap a higher reward. So um, anything to uh, finish us off with, Chris? Uh, You know, we'll get through it. You know, Um, I think the thing to remember is that everyone is dealing with this, you know? So um, just, you know, if you, if you fine tune your own business, your own numbers, you know, I think we've, we've preached that from episode number one is to know Mm -hmm. your numbers. Good products, that's, you know, good profit, good ROI, and good velocity will overcome all this, you know? So just get her, the answer is always get better at sourcing. <laughs> like that's, that's never right. a bad strategy. Um, and it'll be all right. You know, just let the, let the knee jerk reactions and, and the skies falling reactions kind of let them get that out of their system. And, and um, you know, it, it, it'll be all right. Yeah, I agree. All right. That's the show. We will see you guys again next week. Thanks for listening to Clear the Shelf with Chris and Chris. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a screenshot on your phone and share to Facebook, Instagram, or your favorite FBA group. And be sure to tag me and let me know why you liked it and what you'd like to hear more from us in the future. Also, I'd like to give you some free gifts for listening. Head over to rabbittrailchallenge.com and repricerchallenge.com for some free courses to further your business. Thanks for listening.